Yeah, well, I'm a speech language pathologist. I've been working um, in the field for over 20 years as a speech therapist. And in 2007, I um, also became a relationship development um, intervention consultant, just because I was looking for more tools around how to support social competence between a child and their communication partners. Um, and I would say that's definitely my area of, of expertise is social competence and just thinking about those pieces with kids. Um, and I want to give credit to just the RDI community for a declarative language because I learned it within that community and co-regulation, which I know we'll get to. Um, but Dr. Stephen Gutstein, Dr. Rochelle Shealy, they're the ones that taught me about declarative language. So I didn't um, come up with it. I just realized that we needed more written material out there that was accessible for people to learn about it and to just learn how powerful it is because I think that's, you know, that's what always struck me is it made so much sense to me and I saw it make such a difference for kids, but there wasn't a handbook out there yet or people weren't doing it or didn't know about it. And that's kind of what what I decided I wanted to change. And and, and change you did. <laughs> I mean, because it <laughs> really, I mean, I so many. Can everyone hear me now, by the way? Um, yes. OK, good. Um, so. You know, really for everyone, because I just realized, Linda, some people said they couldn't hear me at first because I still am not good with setting up a TV studio on my computer. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, what I just want to tell you real quick is, um, you know, Linda's work has been incredibly influential on, on what I do and really kind of forming what's called the ADHD Dude Methodology. And I just want everyone to know who's who's new to me that, you know, even though I'm a licensed clinical social worker, most of the work I use does not come from the mental health field. It comes from the speech language pathology field. Um, and declarative language, you know, is one of these pieces is that, you know, it's not a, oh, that's a nice thing to work on for kids with ADHD. It's essential. Um, it's it's absolutely essential. So um, just wanted to explain that. And also real quick, because some of you couldn't hear me at the beginning, um, at the top of the chat window here, I put in um, two links. One is for Linda's upcoming uh, parent and professional workshop. And I will tell you that uh, some families after Linda's last ADHD live, which you can watch here at the channel, um, people said it was great. They had really good feedback. They said it was really useful. So I suggest you check out Linda's upcoming workshop. Uh, there's a link there and there's also a link for uh, Linda's blog at uh, declarativelanguage.com and I will also post these in the video description uh, when we're all done for, for you as well. So please make sure to check them out because uh, Linda is a tremendous resource. So we are going to get started now that um, everything's working and I have to say Linda this is the first time maybe I had everything working right. My computer is hardwired. I, I feel like as prepared as you. <laughs> so I'm proud of myself. All right so uh, Linda tell us why I, explain why the co-regulation book after declarative language first of all yeah so I did declarative language first because you know as I said there just isn't a tool out there or information that's accessible to everybody so I felt like that was important um, but in the back of my head I know that I always use co-regulation as another another strategy which I know we'll get into and I always use the two together declarative language and co-regulation and I think after Declarative Language Handbook came out, I was, you know, fortunate to just um, be able to talk to more people about it and receive more questions. And I feel like the biggest question is, well, it doesn't always work. And what do we do when it doesn't work? Which I agree, it doesn't always work. And in my head, I'm like, well, then I use co-regulation or I, I figure out how to pair the two um, to move through whatever it is you're, you, you're wanting to teach the kid or move through. Um, so then I realized that that needed to be my second book just because the two go hand in hand. And I say this in co-regulation handbook, but declarative language is a way of speaking and co-regulation is a way of being. So co-regulation is the mindset that you bring and declarative language is how you talk while you're with the child. And they just are really essential partners. So I just want to mention real quick, I love the way you just said that, that declarative language is a way of speaking and co-regulation is a way of, of being. And I want to tell you, when I was looking for, um, you know, pieces of the book to take pictures of to promote on social media, it was so hard because there's so many of these great little, um, you know, pieces like, like this, because you say things so eloquently that um, the, the book is just chock full of them. So one of the things I want to say is, you know, when Linda first sent me the book, I have to say I hadn't heard the term co-regulation used this way before. So what I would like to do is if you can give us a defin your definition of co-regulation. Yeah, and even just to follow up on what you said, I think that's why I needed to write this book because I think of co-regulation as a positive teaching strategy that you can use with kids regardless of age. 
Um, and if you Google co-regulation, there's so much information on it. But I feel like where it's best known is in the younger years. Um, and I know I say this in the book that I just think people forget about it as kids get older and you just get to prompting. Um, but what co-regulation is, is it just means that we are acting contingently moment to moment. So communication is an unfolding dynamic process where we don't necessarily know what's coming next. We don't control the other person. Um, and what happens is you get in this really wonderful feedback loop with your communication partner. So if it's a child that has a different social learning style than you, you as the guide, the teacher, the parent are right there in the moment to figure out what that breakdown is about. And similarly, the child, um, you know, it's, they, so with kids with different social learning styles, their pace might be faster. So say, for example, kids with ADHD, their pace might just be a lot faster than their caregivers. Or perhaps they need more processing time, so their pace is slower. And what co-regulation does is it really helps everybody get in sync and on the same page so that the teacher can read the child's cues well, but similarly, the child can notice their communication partner's cues. Um, and it just becomes a wonderful, positive feedback loop from which learning and growth can happen. So I and I <laughs> I love I love that definition. I just look every time. Honestly, I, I, this is off script. Every time I hear you talk, I, all I think to myself is, I will never be this good. I will never explain <laughs> things as beautifully as Linda does. Seriously, that's such a good explanation. Um, ex can you explain to us, you know, competent role and authentic role? Um, and if you want, you know, contingent role as well. What do those terms mean in in regards yeah. to co-regulation? Yeah, and so what I just talked about is like what co-regulation is, like when you're thinking about it. But then, but then it's like, okay, what does it mean in application, or how does this, how can I do this in real life? And what I explain in the book is you, what you want to do is start to think about whatever it is that you might want to do with your child. You want to think about what's a competent role that you can assign to them in the moment that can be contingent on your role in the in the moment. So what you end up having is competent contingent roles with your child or between two communication partners. Um, and then, you know, to give a very concrete, basic example, it might be something like you're clearing the table together. So maybe you think my child can't yet put their dish in the dishwasher. That's not a competent role for them, but they can most certainly hand me the dish and I'll put it in the dishwasher. So you create that, um, that assembly line or that, that in sync partnership where the child hands you a dish and you put it in. Um, so that's what it might look like in a, on a practical level, you know, in an activity of daily living. So is it fair to say co-regulation is a type of scaffolding, a term I use a lot? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's absolutely, it's a way to support learning of a new routine. Okay. So this yeah. is, you know, for the population I work with, this learning a new routine tends to be a very hot button issue, okay, which, <laughs> which we'll get into more. But I wanted to use this to kind of segue into these two beautiful examples you give in the book, um, you know, one with your guys, and they're what, in fourth grade and sixth grade? Is that right? They are third grade and sixth grade. Third grade and sixth yep. grade. Okay. Yeah. If you can tell us about that example and then um, the one with uh, the older boy, I forgot his name off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. Jo uh, yeah George in the book. Yeah, um, George. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I think about, and I know I say this in the book, is that, you know, anytime you want a child to learn a multi-step process or routine, um, what co-regulation does is, is it helps you establish a partnership first um, and from there you transfer responsibility to the child little by little versus a linear task where you prompt each step of the way. Like it's a totally different mindset where you're engaging as partners. So the example in my book with my boys is, you know, one day in the fall, it was, I think the room was a disaster, which happens from time to time. <laughs> um, and I, you know, and I just thought, you know, okay, we really need to pause and take a day and just really clean. So, so in my worldview or vision of their bedroom, you know, I see so many things. We have to change the sheets. There's broken toys on the floor. There's laundry overflowing. Never mind their sock drawer. Like we got to figure out the matches in there. Like it could go on and on. And if I were to just say to my boys, uh, clean your room, I know exactly what they would do. They would throw things on their bed or in the closet and then they would be done. <laughs> But um, but because I, I my vision is different and I and I really want them to be competent um, 
helpers around the house as they grow, I knew that day we just need to needed to engage it in a partnership way where I could assign them competent roles. So initially, I knew that they could take their sheets off their bed on their own and put them in the hamper, no problem. So, so that was a role I could give them that was independent. But changing their sheets, where you actually have to get the sheets, mm-hmm. put them on the bed, they have bunk beds, like no way is that something that they could do independently, but they could do in partnership with me. So it was something like, okay, well, I'll take this end and you take that end and we put it on together. Um, and we just moved through all the different tasks to be done in their bedroom as partners with me assigning them responsibility um, where I knew they could be competent, but also thoughtfully guiding, modeling, teaching along the way with the intention of these boys someday are going to change their sheets on their own. We're not going to be doing it as partners forever, but if I want them to get there, I need to start where they're competent and as their partner. Um, and even really recently, they have been changing their sheets all on their own. Have they? they complain yeah. and they tell me <laughs> they can't do it. But then if I take a little long to get up to their bedroom to help them and they know they can't have screens until it's done, it's done. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. So before you get into the example of, with George, cause, and I really like that you put that mm-hmm. in there because I think it's important for parents of older kids to hear this. Um, I, you know, yeah. I want to explain that. You know, one of the things that happens, I see and happens in families a lot, and this is not news to you, is, you know, I'll see families say to kids, go clean your room, right? Now, obviously, right, when you have ADHD, you know, and you don't know kind of where to start and what the end result should look like, because you have your, you know, delayed executive functioning, that feels like an overwhelming task. So what happens then, right? A lot of times kids get oppositional or they say, I'm not doing it and so on. And one of the things I always want people to understand is that it's hard sometimes to parse out, you know, what is um, behavioral in nature, right, to avoid things and what is, you know, a result of frustration around executive functioning that they can't articulate. And and I think, you know, what the two things I kind of see happen are, one, you know, parents will say, well, go clean your room it doesn't happen and they say well he's being oppositional you know and and it's not meant to be oppositional at all right it's it's frustration with not feeling competent I mean is that an accurate way to to phrase that mm-hmm. yeah and I think like the executive function piece is initiation is going to be hard mm-hmm. but it's also going to be hard if it's perceived as an effortful task that the child doesn't perceive themselves to be competent in so you just get out of standstill right and the mm-hmm. other thing I'd like you to do is elaborate a little more on why, let's use the, the room for example, okay, why prompting kids every step of the way is not helpful to learning and learning to move from prompt dependence towards independence, or more importantly, why it's not helpful in developing, you know, a sense of confidence that, that comes from realizing you can, you know, do a task independently. Yeah, I think um, when you're prompting, then they become dependent on you and dependent on your mm-hmm. verbal direction in the moment. And they're going to not necessarily remember the steps the next time around. But if I engage them as a partner and they feel competent, like I talk about this in my book too, when kids feel competent, they naturally seek out the next thing or the next challenge if they feel mastery. So I think when you engage in um, learning as a co-regulatory partnership, you allow kids to feel that mastery where they internalize one aspect of the job and then seek out the next step aspect or are more ready when you when you transfer more responsibility to them. Um, and I think the prompting, it's just like it puts them in this, in, this, in this less competent role because they're constantly dependent on you for the next thing and the next right. thing and the next thing. Right. You know, yeah. as you were describing that, one of the things I was thinking of when I guess I, you know, would have my son help with cooking when, when he was younger um, and I would, you know, and I would talk about kitchen safety a lot. And if I would do, you know, I would do something like, like leave a knife, like a little too close to the counter, you know, he started saying things like, is that a safe choice? And, and really, right. I think what that was is because he developed a level of competency that I know what kitchen safety is, right. I know when my dad is not being careful here, right. And he called me on it, which was, which was fine. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. Cause he felt competent right. in, in that, you know, um, yeah. and it's something I haven't thought about in years, but what you said just, just reminded me of yeah. that. Um, talk, give, can you talk about the example with George? Um, you know, yeah, and how, yeah, cause yeah, to. please. So this is a family that got in touch with me when their son was in high school, like maybe a junior or so. Um, and definitely had, has executive function challenges, ADHD, and there's just life skills that they want him to learn. Um, and so we really, you know, there's everything that they want him to learn, like how to cook, how to clean, how to go shopping. And I think when kids get older, it can feel overwhelming because you want them to learn so much and you just don't know where to start. Um, 
And I say this to, you know, just you just take things one exchange at a time, one opportunity at a time, because you because if you think of all the things that your child can't yet do, then it keeps you from getting started. So really, you want to really step back like we did with George's family and think about, OK, what's one opportunity that you would like to start? And they decided in the kitchen or cooking. And then we took a step back from that. OK, what what is one Thing that you would like him to learn how to make and they took a step back and were able to say well he really likes scrambled eggs he likes to have it for breakfast so it would be really cool and helpful if he knows how to make scrambled eggs so that's where we started you know you just start with where you start you don't start with a zillion things you just start with one opportunity one routine um, so they started uh, his mom started just by teaching him how to make scrambled eggs and initially you know for example it was hard for him to crack the egg like his hand strength was um you know that that just made it hard for mm -hmm. him um so initially his mom cracked the egg but then he was competent at pouring or stirring um she would cook alongside him over time she would help him appraise to know when the eggs were done um you know and as they did this routine over you know several opportunities he was able to learn and um she was able to transfer more and more responsibility of that cooking process and, and and then it just grew from there. So now he can make more meals or different meals. He's also becoming involved in meal planning in the week, <laughs> making a grocery list. And uh, his dad gets him involved in looking for coupons. So <laughs> it started with scrambled eggs, but it's really just, you know, grown from there. Um, and, the, and his parents are really able to transfer more and more responsibility over time. But you just have to start with where the child's competent. Right. And mm -hmm. what, I guess, Leno, you know, the other thing is that if, you know, and I, I had asked you about this this morning, what if kids, you know, in regards to starting where the, you know, the kids are competent, what if they right away start getting into learned helplessness and saying, I can't do this, you know, or start making self-defeating comments of, I'm stupid. And one of the things I talk a lot about with parents is, you know, there's, there's a few things. One is I talk about going down the argument vortex, right? If parents get sucked into arguments with kids or, you know, they respond to what I call noise, which is complaining just for the sake of complaining but really kind of where I see families get off task a lot is when they start feeding into this learned helplessness that often comes from you know kids saying like I'm an idiot I you know or say I can't do it on my own right you have to help me um, but they're not really trying to do it on their own is or maybe they don't have the scaffolding to do it on their own but then really kind of the, the biggest one is the, you know, what I call emotional manipulation. And when I say this, I just want everyone to understand, I don't mean this in a vindictive way at all. What I mean when I say emotional manipulation is if something is challenging for kids with ADHD because they tend to have a lack of resiliency to get through non-preferred tasks, then it's, you know, they, they find that if they say things like, I'm stupid or I'm an idiot, whatever, then that, you know, elicits sympathy in their parents and that often works to get out of a task. And I really like the way you describe this. So I was hoping you can you know describe mm -hmm. how you see this differently than, than I do because I think it's really important yeah. for people to hear yeah. yeah so even the argument vortex yeah like that. yeah please um, so I agree kids love to argue my boys love <laughs> to argue um, but from a like say a co-regulation mm -hmm. mindset what I would think about is in this moment in time whatever we're asking the child to do they don't feel competent and it's not that they aren't competent it's just they perceive in this moment in time that they're not so they default to a predictable pattern of arguing where they are very competent. Mm. So I think that's how, how I see it. It's, it's them moving into creating a competent role for themselves. And, you know, it's kind of up to the pattern, uh, excuse me, up to the, the parent to kind of nip that in the bud and not be part of that pattern because it's not helpful and it doesn't move the child forward. So, wow. <laughs> Again, so, so, like these things, I, like I wish I could come up with these things. Um, I, I really love the way you, you frame that because, you know, it's not about blaming the kid. It's not about saying he's being oppositional, he's being difficult, right? It's that he's falling into a pattern that he's competent with, which is, you know, arguing, right? Or making self-defeating <laughs> comments. So what I would like you to elaborate on is then how do parents with co-regulation, how do they move away from, from kids who that's their competent role to to, towards a competent role we want them to be in. Yeah, so I so one thing that I think is really helpful is you you need to think ahead of time about the competent role that you might want to assign the child and don't surprise them by it. Like it's great to talk outside of the moment at a time when everybody's in a 
positive mood. So whatever that might be, you could say, hey, I've been thinking I'd really love to teach you how to make, for example, scrambled eggs. So tomorrow morning, let's plan to do that. So you're going to plant the seed ahead of time um, so that they have time to process it. Because I think when you surprise kids, it can, it can get that fight or flight response. But then as you enter the routine, you've thought ahead about the competent role that you want to assign them. I think you're less likely to get the arguing, well, you know, yes and no, if you've given them a preview. Or maybe you get the arguing ahead of time, and then you've been able to set your limit. Um, but I was going to say another thing that I really do a lot, I, this is all outside of the moment, is you say to your child, I'm not going to argue anymore. <laughs> so if you disagree with me, that's fine. But if you start to argue, I'm not going to argue back. And you just take yourself out of that equation. So when you're in the argument vortex, as you call it, what I would do is I just say, you're arguing with me, and I, I don't want to argue. And I just either walk away or I, I stop talking back until the arguing has dissipated. Okay. Would you say, though, in those cases that the parent should stop trying to, you know, um, help their child with whatever the task is, you know, and wait till they're, you know, back to a better state of regulation? Or should they keep going in the moment so the kids don't get the message that, oh, all I have to do is start arguing and, and this will end? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, pause. I think pausing is good and mm -hmm. reset. Um, I, you know, it really just kind of depends on the situation and what it might be. Like, ideally with co-regulation, it's a positive experience. Mm -hmm. And if you've given mm -hmm. the child the heads up, you're entering um, an opportunity that they're open to. Like, that's, that's, that's what you want. You don't want negative learning experiences. You want positive learning experiences. So, so when starting out with co-regulation or giving these partnerships a try, like, it's, it's best to start with things that the child might be open to. And then you kind of get your skills down and become more able to navigate um, those times when maybe they're arguing. So I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute, okay? <laughs> and I'm going to ask the question, which I can't anticipate getting, saying, well, my son doesn't like anything but video games, so how am I supposed to do this mm -hmm. if he, there's nothing that appeals to him? Yeah. Well, I would take a step back and mm -hmm. say, do you have, what are the limits that you have around video games? Mm -hmm. And it's okay to use a carrot and stick, yes. you know, yes. before you do video games tomorrow, we need to do this one little thing together. I love that. Um, That's great. So sometimes, you, you know, you have to, I think, balance limit setting, um, you know, in that way. And it's okay to use that thing that they really prefer mm -hmm. or that motivates them in order to engage them in the part that's effortful. So I'm like, last Saturday or Sunday, um, you know, my boys had chores to do, and they sat around all day procrastinating, <laughs> finding a lot of different things to do. But then when they wanted video games or they wanted their screen time, I, I just said, well, you haven't done your chores yet. But and, and then they complained and whined. I said, that's on you. Like, it's on you how I, you manage your time. Um, because I could transfer that responsibility to them. Um, so part of it is just fall, deciding, I think, on the limit that you want to set making sure that it's reasonable, making sure you're, mm -hmm. you're setting your child up for a competent role, and then just sticking to it, no matter how loud they complain. And expect the complaint. Like, don't <laughs> be surprised by it. Like, expect them to not like what you're saying. Right. But that's part of being a caregiver. Right. We can't, they can't be happy all the time. <laughs> right? No, so. they can't. At least my can't. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think the uh, the other thing I want to ask you about is that a lot of times what I hear parents say, whether this is around social learning issues, you know, around executive functioning, but as soon as kids start with that negative self talk, you know, and which which you know, which I often say, let's let's frame it for what it is. It's often this learned helplessness or emotional manipulation. You know, what I find is a lot of parents because they're reactive to it, they think, oh, well, it's hurting his self esteem, so I better stop this. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I try to teach, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, is that, you know, kids develop self-esteem by not us telling them how great they are, but not us, not through us telling them how wonderful they are, but through recognizing their own competencies with themselves. You know, and when mm -hmm. I did training in cognitive behavior therapy, that's one of the premises that people develop confidence by recognizing their own abilities, not from being told them. 
you know. Mm -hmm. So question for you is, you know, how can we help kids, you know, recognize their abilities, right, when when they start, you know, whether they're hitting themselves in the head and saying I'm stupid or whatever. How do we, you know, is that a time to be teaching them, you know, and tapping into episodic memory to help them understand their strengths or would you say that's not the time for it? Well, I think when kids are escalated or their emotions are mm-hmm. heightened, heightened, they're not necessarily even going to take in anything that you say. Like kids aren't in a place to reason when they're heightened. So it's maybe in that moment it's deciding do they need space and quiet to kind of work out those emotions on their own. Um, because I don't think it's our job to support and scaffold and guide, but we can't fix everything for kids. Right. Like sometimes they just have to work that out themselves. Like like I said before, if, if they're upset about something, Um, it's okay to be upset. Being upset is not a bad emotion, and part of growing is learning how to manage your upset feelings. Um, But where the competence would come in wouldn't necessarily be in that moment when they're upset, but it's all the opportunities you have along the way to assign them competent roles. So I think the more you have your radar on in in your home for competent roles that you can provide to your child or engage them in authentic routines, the more they will gain self-confidence because they feel it internally. So to add on, this is, I want to add on to something you said, but ask a question. So I, you know, I think that's so important about this, you know, that we have to constantly be building these competent roles and finding them, right, and increasing them, obviously, as, as kids become more more capable. Um, you know, with, with that being said, what I tell parents is, you know, because what the questions I get a lot is, well, how do I know if he's not really making these, you know, self-defeating comments because for, you know, because he wants to get out of it? What if he really feels that way? And what I say is it doesn't matter the reason behind it. You don't want to give attention to it, right? Because the more you give attention to it, the more that that's going to grow and the more it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't know if you agree with that or, you know, what, how you feel that co-regulation fits into that piece, but yeah. Yeah. Like I think in those moments, I'm not going to over talk with a kid. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, I don't think they're necessarily going to hear what you have to say. If they're making a self-defeating comment, I might say something like, you know what? I disagree with you because I have a lot of memories of you where you've been really successful. Mm Mm-hmm. And maybe I'll name a couple, but I'm not going to go on and on and on and on um, because then that's just too much. It's too much talking, too much information. And you're going to get more bang for your buck if you highlight those moments when they're happening. And and just I think the more kids have competent roles, the more they feel better about themselves. Right. So what what role? Well, one, can you you know for I don't know if everybody who's watching if they um, if they're familiar with episodic memory. Can you explain that real quick and kind of right because I think this is so important in regards to what you're saying right now. Yeah. Um, so episodic memory is just the memories we have um, that might relate to the here and now. So anytime we're in a new situation, it might be a problem that we need to solve, a new environment that we're in. Our brain automatically goes back to think about. What's a similar situation or place that I've been with, been to in the past that I can apply something that I've learned at this moment in time? Um, And even I'll just give an example that I use in Declarative Language Handbook because it really helps me is when I was in college and I traveled around Europe and we went to um, what was then Czechoslovakia and I remember going into a grocery store. And um, there were so many things that were different. You know, the food was different, the language was different, the setup was different. So if I focused on the differences, it would have been really scary. But because I have good episodic memory, I could see the pattern of grocery store Mm -hmm. and I could focus on the the similarities. And therefore, I could problem solve well and feel competent in that moment. And I think with kids, um, the more we slow down and highlight things in the moment that they're learning or help them connect the dots over time, the more we help them use their episodic memory to problem solve or navigate new situations. You know, one of the things I heard Sarah Ward say once, and I absolutely find this true, is that for kids with ADHD in particular, you know, they might have adequate episodic memory. However, it tends to be attached to strong negative emotions often. You know, not even always negative, but what I find is it tends to be, right, that they tend to remember those experiences when there's a negative emotion attached to it. Where when it's something more subtle, like having a competency and, you know, unloading the dishwasher, that might be harder for them to recall, right, and to connect to to the Mm -hmm. present. Is that your experience as well or yeah absolutely because mm-hmm. I think the memories that stick the most are the ones that have big emotions mm-hmm. and so the negative emotions sometimes they're just bigger um, 
but I think that's also the great thing about co-regulation. It helps you slow down, be present in the moment with the child. So when there's those nice, competent roles, mastery, you're really there to highlight it with them and help them store that memory for later recall. Um, you know, the, the, the good moments might go by so fast and, and they don't mm -hmm. store those memories as readily as the big ones. That's a because, great point. You know, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, before we get to some questions, uh, somebody had asked me last night if uh, they should read the books in order. So should somebody read declarative language first and then co-regulation? Yeah. You know what I think? Um, I think you could do either. I feel like declarative, they both just are so complementary. Declarative language, though, I think when you get into co-regulation, you want to be able to speak in a declarative way. Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe it would make sense to read declarative language first and then co-regulation. Right. Okay. But, but know that when you're reading declarative language handbook, like I'm not done yet saying what I need to say and there's still more to come when you feel stuck. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to make the point, you know, I, I have a new membership site uh, coming out in a few weeks, and I'm actually going to put both books on there. And what I'm going to tell people is, you know, I think you should read these before you start my membership site. And and what I really want people to understand is that, you know, again, this is not just a nice thing to do. Like, this is essential if you want to help your child develop, you know, um, greater independence and help them improve their executive functioning, and most importantly, help them feel competent, you know. So, so you know, please, you know, take this seriously. Um, and when I say take it seriously, you know, I not saying that anybody wouldn't take it seriously, but know that um, there's such tremendous value in this. And really, one of the wonderful things about Linda's books are that they're short. Okay, so you're not going to get you know 20 chapters of academic information. It's the, they're very practical. She gets right to the point. And for somebody like myself who tends to you know start <laughs> rushing through books, um, I read them both very easily um, because they are short and because she gets into it right away. So I want to thank you for that because you just make the mm -hmm. experience of of reading them, but also being able to take from it. It's a very easy process. Process, you know so yeah yeah good that yeah. was my goal yes. just make it accessible it is they're very accessible yeah. they are yeah all right can we can you yeah. answer a few questions all mm -hmm. right uh first one um how do you know when the i'm so stupid i'm such a jerk comments are no longer arguing attention seeking and are a larger issue almost nine year old boy i have my own thoughts about that but i want to hear from you first yeah well you know what i th i do think i think like you were saying, Ryan, a lot of the important tools um, that we can bring to kids are from, say, speech language therapy and mm -hmm. executive function, just building tools. But that doesn't mean we don't need a mental health expert on the team because kids are at risk for depression, anxiety, et cetera. And, and I would defer to the mental health uh, person in those moments because that's outside of my scope of practice. So, Ryan, what would you say? <laughs> Well, that's that's so funny, Linda, you say that, because as a mental health professional, I'm going to say the opposite. I'm going to <laughs> defer to uh, to your books, and here's the reason why. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sitting in, I, I'm going to be blunt about this, that for me, sitting in the therapist's office talking about why do you feel that way, you know, and, um, and doing, you know, affirmations, whatever, that's not helping build competency. Building competency, I think particularly for boys, comes from experiences. You know, and, and one of the things we know there's, you know, one of the differences I've read about, you know, the way boys' brains and girls' brains work differently is that, you know, boys tend to do better with learning when they're engaged in a task where they're involved some kind of, you know, um, physical movement, some manipulation of materials like Legos or whatever it is. Um, so I, I would say I think that, you know, regardless of, of, you know, what it is that, again, the way to build competency is through developing these skills, right? Not sitting in a therapist's office talking. So that's my take. So obviously a little different than, than Lynn. Does, um, mm -hmm. and, and I think where I'm coming from is is more I'm trying to look at the practical end of, of saying right what's what's better talking or doing that's that's kind of my thing and I'm not trying mm -hmm. to you know disregard the, the need for mental health services but look the reality is most families I speak with have tried mental health services sometimes multiple ones um, and they just don't see the results that they're looking for and understandable because you know mental health counseling therapy whatever tends to not address executive functioning issues or ADHD related issues you know and that just it is what it is so um, so next question uh, son is 14 almost 15 I see the shutdown and less competency happen at school um, activities and assignments always changing how can I handle this how much support should I provide um, 
Okay, so so this is more yeah school based, and it sounds like it's around academics. So, and she's asking how much support should she you know provide around this in helping develop competency with you know the school piece. And I think that's a great question because my question would be right where where is a parent's role in in that piece? Yeah, and for example, school like well, I mean, there's so many pieces. There's the academic work itself, but then there's there's the org organizational piece of time management, of getting it done. And I think if your child is not competent and flailing, then get in there as their partner. Don't be shy about it because the goal is to meet them where they're at and build them up rather than, you know, let them stay in the deep end where they're failing. So does that look like sitting down with them every night and doing homework? Does it look like telling them what's for homework, prompting them during homework? Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit what that should look like. So so say, for example, and, and I think it depends on the child, mm -hmm. too, and how open they are and where they are, are at in this. But, for example, if there's math homework and it's tricky for them and they're extremely frustrated, mm -hmm. absolutely sit alongside them. Um, but what you want to be thinking about is, you know, what maybe have they learned in the past that is similar, that you can attach a pattern, mm -hmm. you know, help them use their episodic memory, what might be a competent role for them in that math problem um, that you can assign to them starting out while you maybe scaffold the other part and then just gradually transfer knowledge and responsibility. Um, for time management, you know, it might be a matter of sitting down with the child, um, creating a calendar with them, helping them see the future a little bit about when things are due and their time in their week. Um, but I think you can't necessarily just give them a calendar and expect them to do that. You would want to do it in partnership with them to show them how it's done, to show them how we think about planning for time or time management. Mm -hmm. You know, as you were saying that, I, one thing I thought about was um, – you know, I, I always struggled with math when I was growing up. I had a math tutor forever. And I think about now, what would that have looked like if I felt more competent having, right, say, somebody said to me, well, here's the part you can do, and then let's do this part together, right? Yeah. Instead of just say, you try it, nope, it's wrong, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I can't, like, maybe I would like math now if that was the case. Do you know what I mean? Right. Right. So that's yeah. huge. So I love that. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and it, I give this example in my book, mm -hmm. but it could be even something like you help them do the first two problems, but then you see they've got it and you walk away for a little bit, letting them know I'll be back in a minute or two mm -hmm. to check back in and see how you're doing. Um, so you're gradually fading back your presence as you notice they're competent and ready for you to fade back. Right. Okay. Uh, next one. Our son is in high school. We are trying to teach academic time management. What co-regulation techniques would you use to help in this process? Yeah. I mean, I'd get a calendar. I'd put it down on the table. I'd, I'd think through the different tasks that they might have. And together, I would map out the calendar and show them how it's done. Co-regulation might be, um, you know, you could think about what, what would be more competent for the child. Would it be actually writing on the calendar mm -hmm. um, and you're the reading mm -hmm. person, the reader of the assignments, or would it be better for them to read the assignments and then you write it on the calendar? You could kind of create contingency that way. I think where they're going to need your help is the actual problem solving around time right. and thinking about where in my week might this fit in and helping them remember the different parts of their week. You know, while you have you know, baseball practice on this mm -hmm. day and piano lesson on this day. So let's mark that in together. Um, so I think, I think it could just be a really nice process together, but you want to get down and do that calendar in partnership right? with the intention of transferring that responsibility over time. So you're a complete partner this time, but maybe mm -hmm. next month you're able to transfer a little bit more of the thinking or problem solving. So, so you know, I, I just want to mention to the person who asked this, I teach um, what, you know, about uh, learning how to feel time in uh, webinar three of my executive function crash course series. And uh, what um, you, what Linda just brought up about, you know, partnering in terms of, you know, putting things down on a calendar and so on, I teach that in, in webinar five. And that's exactly what, what I do teach is that you start doing this together, right? It's not something we just throw on kids. And parents, a lot of times will say to me, well, can I have them sit down and watch this? I say, no, it doesn't work like that, right? This has to be a collaborative effort with the idea, right, of this gradual release of responsibility like, like Linda's 
talking about. So, um, and by the way, I, I really like that you brought up writing things down um, because I am all for that. And I actually just did exactly what you described with a boy a few days ago with taking, mm-hmm. you know, so he would, he would um, tell me what was in his Google calendar for his classes. I did this with a high schooler and then I would write it down on the calendar. So yeah. So I'm glad you used that example. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and even next time around, you might think about, okay, we've got this pattern down next time he's, he's also going to write some of them, and I'll write some of them. So maybe you fade back as the writer for some of them, and that's where you're transferring. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I was even thinking even to back it up a little bit, um, like another nice co-regulatory pattern Mm -hmm. with time management might be, like initially you just have to think about your week. So it could be a brainstorming. You do a brainstorming act, like, okay, together, let's think Uh. of all the things in your week. So, and you can decide, is the child the idea person or are they the writer? Um, so maybe they think of all the things in their week and you write it down or vice versa. Um, and you add ideas once, once kind of they've thought of all that they can and maybe you know there's a few more things. But then once you have it all out on paper, then together you can then transfer it to a calendar in a way that fits. Right. There we yeah. and, and let's, you know, I, I want to just, you know, emphasize the point, too, that I think this is just really good for the parent-child relationship to, to work this way, right? Because we're moving away from mm-hmm. saying, you know, you have to do this or why didn't you do this, right? It's it's about being proactive than being reactive, really, I think is what this comes down to, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's, and it's really just setting everything up in a positive way. Mm-hmm. Like when you're prompting them to do something that maybe is hard or they don't feel competent in and they argue it's just a negative downward spiral right but if you join as partners you get that positive forward momentum everybody feels better um you have your kids back they know but you also are transferring responsibility so that they're gaining skills it just positive forward momentum is what i feel like co-regulation gives us all I like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention just a few more questions. That I see some questions here that I'm going to say I think are a lot of um, a little bit out of Linda's league. So I'm, I don't mean to ignore anybody, but I'm just going to skip those because they're not so pertinent to the topic. But um, I will definitely you know address in a future ADHD live um, ADHD do live some of these behavior questions you're asking. Um, question from I'm going to guess he's in first grade. So uh, my son is seven and is just starting to exhibit learned helplessness. I'm trying to help guide him through problem solving but his school is not playing ball, how might be best to handle the school? If I can just say one thing real quick first about that. Yeah, I I just want to say, I don't think it's that the school is not playing ball. I think the school probably does not have the skill set, okay, to um, to understand how how to help him with this. And one of the things I I always want to encourage parents to understand is, you know, um, I don't think it's helpful to, and I'm not saying this parent is doing this, but I don't think it's helpful to kind of beat up on, on teachers and say they can't do this. At the end of the day, you know, people need to understand teachers, even special ed teachers, they get really no training in ADHD. They get little to no training in executive functioning. So that's, yeah, I just want to mention that. So go ahead, please. Yeah. So, so I think that is where declarative language would come in Mm -hmm. because I think, um, I think a lot of the time people are putting demands on kids or asking them questions and, and expecting them to come up with answers and information that they don't yet have. So as a first step, I would just introduce declarative language as a different way of providing the child information that they need. And you're saying to do that at home? To do it at home, but right. also, you know, you could, you could share resources with the school because I do think teachers who learn about it do appreciate and, and see the value in it. Yeah. Well, let me let me mention to Linda's point. I've shared um, her her brief article on declarative language with quite a few teachers, and they found it really helpful. And I've had teachers say to me, you know, I've used this with my whole class, not just with you know the kids with ADHD or autism, mm-hmm. whatever. So um, I, I also I think also that it's important to mention that when we're talking about this, right? This is not this is not need to be just isolated to kids with ADHD, right? I mean, declarative language and co-regulation can help any kid. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just positive teaching strategies right. for everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and I mean, tell me your thoughts. I mean, are you with me that with with schools? I mean, I just I find that it's not a matter of that they're mm-hmm. not trying to cooperate. It's just they don't have the skill set necessarily. Yeah. Do you find? Yeah. Or they just might not yet. No. I mean, that's why I wrote the book. Not enough right. people know that exactly. People know what they don't, what they know, and they don't know what they don't, don't yet know. Right. And you know. Yeah. It's just a matter of sharing information and then letting them see or make the discovery that, oh, wow, this, this really does work. And I don't need to quiz the child in order for them to learn. Exactly. I can guide them through language. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so okay, that's I'm, I'm not, this is a yeah medication question. I'm not going to answer. Um, okay, so I think that's probably it for questions. I guess um, two things I just want to mention real quick. Um, and uh, again, everyone, my apologies. I couldn't get to all the questions here. Um, I try to keep this, you know, in somewhat of a relative time frame because people's attention span for watching videos is only so long. But thank you, Linda. This has been incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit what to expect if somebody uh, is going to take your. Uh, uh, you know your um, your webinar. Uh, well, I guess what would we call it? Really, a class, not a webinar. The workshop. The workshop. Yeah. yeah. So we, um, thanks for asking. So it's an eight-week workshop. Every other week, um, I provide content. So the first class is just an overview of declarative language. Um, the third week, we talk about co-regulation and guiding. The fifth week, we talk about nonverbal communication, and the last week, we talk about appreciating different opinions. Um, uh. So that's just where I have a formal presentation that I share and then the off weeks is more discussion open-ended problem solving and participants can submit an audio clip a video clip a written anecdote of them uh, with their child so we can actually problem solve in real time and think through um, you know or, or notice how they're making great changes in their declarative language but also troubleshoot when something feels stuck um, or provide next steps if they're doing a great job so it's just more individualized, active practice, putting this all um, in place or, you know, to work in the moment with your kid. I have to tell you, I don't think I've heard of anybody saying, like, bring some clips, you know, to mm -hmm. to our workshop. I love that you do that. That's really cool. Yeah, it's actually a very, uh, it's it's an essential part of RDI is uh -huh. to share video clips and then their consultant um, works with them on whatever objective it is. But the parents practice the particular objective, and then the, when they feel ready for feedback, they send their consultant a clip. Um, so we're doing this in a similar way um, with the focus on communication and declarative language and in a group setting so parents can learn from each other and professionals. Okay. I uh, just wanted yeah. to mention a comment real quick. Uh, somebody, Erin, said these processes really do work. I started a very similar program with my son at seven. Five years later, he's confident in several areas of life. Very helpful. Thanks, Linda. So that's great to hear. Uh, yeah. And, and again, I, I yeah. you know, everybody who um, I've known who has uh, read or listened to uh, declarative language has, has said the, the same thing. Um, somebody else asked, uh, will uh, co-regulation handbook be coming out as an audio book as well? It is. It just came out this week as audiobook. So if you go on Amazon, it's there oh. as an audiobook. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, because I, I looked last week. I didn't see it. So it just came out this yes. week. Very That's cool. Okay, yeah. excellent. All right. So, Linda, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time and just your tremendous wealth of information. And if I could ask you a huge favor, when I eventually uh -huh. release my book on social skills for boys, I would love to have you on to speak about it because um, oh, yeah. I have not met a whole lot of people in my career who, who get kind of male-male social communication like you do. Mm -hmm. So Can I tell a quick Story yeah, please, please. About um, so this is the first time I heard Ryan speak at a social thinking conference years ago, and it was about social skills for boys and how it's different. Yeah, and I know you said this along the way, but just the biggest thing is boys are doers, not talkers. So don't sit around just you know having tea with them. Just get them doing things. And I have two boys, so I was at um, like I had taken my child, um, my older son, to to a coffee shop, not to have coffee and talk, but you know to go get a a snack one day and I was thinking about you and I was like okay I'm just gonna sit here and not say anything <laughs> because I want to see what my son wants to do or talk mm -hmm. about and then like moments of silence went by and then he's like hey mom do you want to arm wrestle <laughs> so I was like I would love to in the cafe that's like a boy, yeah, yeah. that's like, great oh, I'm not gonna talk about your feelings mm -hmm. but we will arm wrestle or thumb wrestle so he made me laugh <laughs> that's awesome and uh yeah very cool. Uh, no quick, call. oh, quick question. Uh, Miss Arlene from uh, Good Talking People in North Jersey asks: Any workshops for professionals coming up? Any more uh, workshops for professionals? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking. So I won't have any over the summer, but I do want to put together some things for the fall and the next year, and maybe um, separate professional and parent workshops, just um, because they might want different information mm -hmm. or a different different environment. So. So stay tuned for the fall. All right, excellent. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I love that yeah. story. <laughs> you just, yeah. the, that's great. <laughs> I mean, it's such a perfect yeah. example. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, so thank right. you, thank you everybody for joining us today. Again, I will post uh, the links are up in the top of the chat here, but I will also post them in the video description for Linda's blog and um, her upcoming uh, workshop. So please check both of them out. And Linda, thank you so much. It's always great to talk yeah, to you. Thank you for having me. All right, I appreciate ha- it. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you.